You're listening to the Yes, I'm Still Sober podcast with John Rabin. That's right, it's the Yes, I'm Still Sober podcast with John Rabin, episode 64. Hello, everybody. It is, uh, I'm recording this on September 11th, but... The majority of people who listen to this episode will initially hear it on September 12th. And September 12th is my mother's birthday. It is also my declared sobriety date for my mom for her birthday, basically. Um, For being real, I probably quit uh, the last time I uh, had alcohol or or drugs of any kind was sometime in August in 2012 sometime I don't remember the exact day but I made it officially September 12th uh, 2012 because that was the day that my mother on her birthday drove me from San Antonio back to Austin to essentially turn myself in to go to jail and uh, that's what I thought I would talk about today I've I've talked about it before but this is more for people who might drop in on it uh, newer people or just a reminder as to uh, just things because I might I'm recording this a little later than normal because uh, I had errands to run today but also my mom came up and we had lunch uh, and she gave me my uh, she buys me an AA chip every every year uh, and gives it to me when we uh, meet for her birthday. And uh, this year, you know, got the seven year chip. It's like a fancy coin. I say fancy. This one glows in the dark. <laughs> she picks a different color every year because she's like, ah, oh, variety. And I, you know, in case I decide to get them framed. Not, but if I did, they'd all be just a different, you know. So she's like, well, this is new. I thought I'd get one that you could find in the dark for those, you know, seven-year chip emergencies. Uh, it's, I'm ready to go. But uh, so we did that earlier today, and uh, she's doing fine, and so am I. So we had a, we had a good time. But, uh, yeah, that's... That's essentially what happened is um, I had violated my probation by getting arrested for public intoxication at my 20 year high school reunion. And I was on felony probation at the time. So that violates probation, obviously. So. And so they had uh, scheduled a probationary a a meeting with my probation officer in Austin on September 12th. Um, and they say that because they don't want you to know that they're going to arrest you. But, uh, you know, my PO at the time in San Antonio, this, this, uh, this, this Buddhist bike riding probation officer, like totally, she, she just kind of under the table goes, listen, they're going to arrest you. So go ahead and get your affairs in order and know that that's going to happen. And I'm like, well, that's good to know. So, like, I did, I mean, I guess for most people, most people on probation, I guess if they find out they run or they don't come in, they're like, you're going to have to come get me. Uh, Not me, though. That actually is quite helpful for somebody like me. I was like, oh, well, let me get everything prepared and, you know, like, let my job know that uh, I don't know how long I'll be gone. You may want to get somebody new. Um, I wrote a check, a a post-dated check for rent for October, you know, to my roommate because I I thought I would just be coming back. I thought, ah, maybe I'll be gone a couple of weeks. I was gone for six months. Never went back to San Antonio. They, uh, (laughs) I got locked up for a while um, and did treatment and all that, but uh, which was actually fairly easy once you already made the decision to quit drinking so like it was a nice the six months was actually just a reinforcement for me and that's the thing uh that's kind of what i want to talk about real real quick uh let me 
just adjust this here. So what happens is in an AA meeting, when you go and pick up your chip for whatever year, you know, five year, 10 year, whatever, you know, it's been seven years, seven year chip, whatever it is, you go in to the meeting and, you know, they like pass out chips. It's probably, you know, this typically is at the end of the meeting, but uh, you don't care. It's fine. Uh, so they, you go up and get your chip. And then what they do is they tend to try to put people on the spot, you know, to help out some of the newer people who, you know, are trying to get sober or clean in the meeting. So they, so you get the chip and they, and they all go, how do you, how did you do it? And then the person goes, oh, uh, well, you know, I just really uh, tried and, uh, you know, I just had enough. And, uh, you know, uh, one day at a time. Is that what the what are the sayings? One day. at a, That's what I did. One day at a time. I just I kept going to meetings. Right. That's what we're saying. I kept going to meetings and et cetera, et cetera. They do that a lot. You just kind of, because uh, it's hard to, you know, you're getting put on the spot. You're like, fuck, man, I don't know. I struggled through this shit. That's, it's, it's a really weird thing, but I'm, but I'm going to do that to myself right now. It's like, I'm going to actually put myself in that position and go, John, how did you do it? And it's really the, the difficult part about it, and I, and I know that that telling people, you know, what you did, because the thing is that everybody's going to be different. So, what works for somebody is not going to work for everybody, but you might get some good ideas out of it. And I think it's just hearing the stories, the just the encouragement to help people find their own way. And their own path. I think they incur. I think just hearing that uh, somebody else did it, because I, because I think that if somebody can see me, somebody who really knows me, or at least knew me back in the day, and then can and then kind of getting an idea of who I am now from listening to this bullshit I do every week. Uh, thank you for supporting this bullshit, by the way. But I think that because what, what I, I want them to get from this is, holy shit, if that motherfucker can do this, I can, I can quit drinking. I mean, this fucking guy can't commit to shit. Am I right, people? Can he, can, you know, so if anything, I kind of, you know, inspiration by going in this the same kind of thing is when you go to uh when comedians uh, went to their first open mic and they they see some shitty some si- shitty comedians and they go fuck if that guy with that material is getting booked i can i can do this this is you know you don't want to you don't want to see a Chappelle or a Bill Burr, you know, your first time. You go, well, that's not, that's obviously not a my leak. But you see somebody just eat a bag of shit on stage and you're like, well, I can, I can eat a bag of shit. You know, I've got a mouth. So I digress. But that's the thing is that it's real, I guess it's real easy for me to say uh, that, you know that I got sober pretty that it was the it was easy because I didn't have a choice because I was locked up for six months but I did I, I made the choice beforehand not knowing that I still had to pay my dues for fucking up and then go to county jail for a month before getting into that uh, the smart quote unquote smart program which was a five month long program essentially making me in Travis County custody for six months but that really sealed the deal because I got to spend 
got to spend six months with uh, just some real pieces of work at their not very best at their not at not not their best so I got to be around people who weren't great not at their best so that was uh it, that was a nice encouragement to go mm. like especially when you see yourself in others you're like you're like boy that guy's that guy's pathetic oh shit so was i yeah i did that kind of shit and uh and i think that's the that's the deal and i don't go to meetings because i'm not an aa guy and that was the thing is that i didn't uh you guys have heard me talk about that talk about the uh I, I have some issues with uh, some things in AA, although I'm not against them. Um, I do think it's odd, by the way, that the program back like 70 plus years ago when it started, that they wrote the idea in the, in the, the big book about you know principles over personalities. Do you understand what that means? That means that they had the forethought to recognize that their program was going to create assholes. That's amazing to me. They saw that this would create judgmental pricks. That's, there's, it, that's, that's mind-blowing that they're like, all right, I can already see where this is going. We're going to help some people, but this is going to churn out some major a-holes. So this is, might come back on us and make us look bad. So let's keep the program pristine by reminding people it's the principles, not the personalities. Program, you know, the the views of the individual do not express the views of the, the AA. Which is, which if you think about it, principles over personalities, I mean, isn't that just about every organization? They're like, you know, it's like democratic socialism. Like, he's like, you read it, it's like, this sounds pretty good. Then you meet one, and you're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to get political. I just like making fun. Um, but anyway, back to me. Um, so, yeah, I had some help, which you're going to need help. You can't do it alone. I mean, you probably can. You could if you had the right mindset, but most people are not in the right mindset and you need, you need help uh, in order to be more functional. I, you know, try to, try to get some help. People will help you if they know that you're trying and you're trying to better yourself. People will help you. That's, you know, no matter how much you think people suck, when it comes to a one-on-one -on -one connection, people want to help somebody who's struggling, who's reaching out for it. That's just it's it's just natural within us, unless you're with, you know, unless we're talking about like some sociopath or a real piece of shit who's needs to work on themselves. But most people are, most people will help if you ask. Yeah. So the other thing, oh uh, yeah. So I can only imagine incidentally that I what was I saying oh yeah about the uh, principles over the personalities that's the whole thing and that's why I couldn't that's why I couldn't go to I did I, I personally didn't like AA meetings because I didn't like the people um, when I started doing things correctly and actually really really trying because I went to AA for so long on and off that uh, when I was you know, doing heroin and stuff and it just didn't, you know, and I relapse over and over again and it's just, I didn't really give it a, a good try. So by the time I was really, you know, I fucked myself out of doing it because I figured out, quote unquote, I thought I was too smart for AA because I figured out how it worked. And I'm like, I, I get it. And the problem with that is, is that if you put yourself in that kind of situation where you think you're smarter, than that organization or than that program, then it's not going to work for you because you've just, you've already closed it off. 
and that you've actually made it harder for yourself because it's all it's already you know set up and you're like well i could just follow that but no we're gonna we're gonna do it we're gonna do it the hard way apparently uh which is probably fine because i was already sick and tired of being around those kind of people being in treatment with those people i was then i had to go into a sober house when I got out of uh, the smart program and I was living in a sober house for a while and it just was, I was like, man, it just, I did not want to be around the people. I I definitely stayed to myself. I had been, you know, living in a a closet with seven other um, alcoholic drug addict criminals and uh, very tight quarters. And it's like, "Mm, you know, I've had enough with people. And uh, so I, I, I had to do my own thing. And it's and it'd be funny. It would be funny to go to a meeting and get a chip and have them go, you know. So how did you do it? How'd I do it? Well, first, you get arrested eight times. All right. Multiple times for alcohol. You get on felony probation. All right. Once on felony probation, you decide at age 34 to start doing heroin. Everybody still with me? 34 years old. You're an alcoholic already, but you decide, you know what I'm going to do? I've been dabbling in pills. They're fine, but I want to do heroin. Also, I'm 34. So you start doing heroin at 34 and you really do a tailspin. You go down pretty fucking quick because you've already established the addiction with the alcoholism that you've embraced and just, uh, you know, took a swan dive in the middle of and just, uh, the bar life, here we go. But now you're doing heroin. Now, you can't do both heroin and alcohol, you guys, because when you do both of them at the same time, you tend to die a lot. So what you need to do is you pick one and you think about it and you go, eh, you know what? Heroin's the shit. So I'm going to stop drinking. So you successfully stop, stop drinking because you're doing heroin now. So then you finally bottom out. You get fired. You get evicted because you can't pay rent. You go sleep on somebody's couch for a while. You try to get clean. You don't get clean, but you try. Kind of. You relapse over and over again. You try to get a job. You end up getting a part-time job. But then you get an infection in your arm because you didn't bleach your needles right. So you go to the hospital for two weeks. And after you get out, you've got no job. You stay in Austin for maybe about another month. Then you go live with your dad. So you go live with a parent at your age. You're almost 40. Now you're living with a parent. You OD after staying clean for a month. Because you overdose, you freak everybody out and they're going to throw you out unless you actually really get help. Then you go to rehab. Now, rehab gets you clean off of heroin, but now you're in a different city and you can't get a job So because you're a felon and you're still on felony probation while this is all going on, by the way. So then you get uh, you start washing dishes or some other kind of manual labor job because it's the only job you can get. But somehow you love it more than working in a cubicle. So you do that for a while, but because you're in San Antonio and you're bored as shit, the only thing you have to do is drink. So you start drinking again because you think, well, it's not heroin, but remember, you're still an alcoholic. So you fuck up once again, and then you have to go turn yourself in and, uh, and spend six months in jail and then eventually end up in a sober house. And that is how you get clean. Are there any questions? No, I'll take my chip now. So that's not really a program I would recommend to anybody. It's uh, because there's a whole lot in there about, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of luck in there. There's a whole lot of reasons in there to die that you could have could have been killed. And by you, I mean me. But. I'm out of lives. That's that's for sure. If I was if I was a cat, I'd be. Uh, that's that's at least eight of them. But uh, but in seri- but seriously, but seriously, folks, uh, how how did I get my mind? I I think it was a matter of um, 
really finally just having enough. You know, this is enough. I've now lost everything twice. This is, you know, when I when I finally quit, I I I was lucky with alcohol because I lived long enough to drink myself out to just go, ah, you know what? I'm not going to get a new bar experience. There's not going to be something new that happens in a bar to me that I haven't already done. I'm tired of this. I'm just, eh. Lone Star? No. No more. Uh, no more whiskey. I'm just done. I'm like, ugh. Too many. It's all I did. I'm like, it's enough. I've done enough. It's like at some point, you're like, really? Are we... Are we going dancing again, you know, again with this? And I just, uh, so I was lucky in that aspect that I just had enough of that. So that actually helped get into the position of, you know, finally of mentally shifting and going, now we're going to, now we're going to work on, now we're going to work on me. We're really going to do this shit because I'm done because I had just had enough. And uh, I don't know how you do that when you're right in the middle of it. Like, I don't know how, how you quit when you're younger. I got lucky that I didn't kill myself by the time that I finally had had enough. And then the six months of being locked up, you know, having, having uh, Travis County on your shoulder with the probation and everything else just keeping me in check really helped out so that by the time I was off probation, by the time I was out of custody and on my own, and I didn't have anybody looking over my shoulder. I had already been on a path of this is who I am now. And I think that's what, that's the big thing is that if, you know, keep, you keep going and you convince yourself that this is who you are. And this is your, you know, and doing those new habits and the new behavior patterns for long enough that it's almost more difficult to go back than it is to keep going in the trajectory that you're going. Also, it's going to help if you have something to obsess over. Somebody that inspires you, somebody's writings, a, uh, a religion might help, assuming we're not talking about Scientology. Uh, um, for me, as I've mentioned several times on this podcast, it was uh, the Four Agreements and Fight Club, and then also uh, Zen. So I just kind of bounced among, you know, I used the four agreements because there was, you know, there was four things to follow. And that was easy. It was basic. And then, you know, then, of course, my obsession was Fight Club and then also uh, Zen. I just used whatever else uh, in like in order to change my mindset using those kind of different things for inspiration, whatever, and, uh, and just moving forward and, uh, giving me something to, uh, um, to obsess over and something to do. Um, this also reminds me that I need to, I haven't exercised, I haven't worked out in a week. I kind of work out at work, but, uh, <laughs> there's, it's a little physical at work, but, uh, I need to actually get back into my exercise program. Um, that just reminded me. Sorry. Sorry, guys. I just got sidetracked and went, fuck, I need to work out some. Um, the other thing is that you also need to understand that, I'll tell you from my point of view, that it's just a different phase you know, you're not trying to make yourself better. You're just trying to make yourself functional. That's that's the way I, I it's a mindset. It's all about a mindset and the mindset shouldn't be, you know, I want to 
I want to be a better person. It's, I mean, that's, I guess that's, that's a, that's an interesting goal, but I, I just want to be me. And the more genuine me that I am with the amount of fucking awareness that I've got going on, I'm naturally going to be better than I was when I was a junkie or a blackout alcoholic. Obviously. If not, well, you know, you be the best you that you can be. What if you're an asshole? Well, you be the best asshole that you can be. Uh, so it, you know, it's not all gravy. You know, I've got mad anxiety. And I pace like a motherfucker. And I can't sit still. My brain is going all the time. So, you know, I just breathe, man. I just breathe and, uh, you know, focus on the, on day to day, just, you know, present, being present, not trying to let the, uh, I'm trying to get, you know, overwhelm myself with everything else. That's the thing is that there's plenty of, uh, you know, plenty of people out there that deal with the same kind of shit which is also great because you know when you hear about people dealing with anxiety and the worries of they you know it reminds you that you're you're actually all right because you're not alone everybody else is dealing with the same kind of shit so it's like oh good have i reached normalcy no 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 you're not normal you've got an addictive personality that's a bitch my friend Look how much you vape and drink caffeine. Whole. But, uh, yeah, so it's not, it's not all wonderful. But, uh, it's different. And, uh, it turn, and I'm happy. So I guess that's okay. I wish I could write more jokes. I could use more material. But other than that, I think I'm doing all right. So seven years, you guys. Woo. That's something. It's come a long way. Quit smoking. Quit doing drugs. Quit drinking. I have a scooter now. I don't skateboard. Finally, but oh yeah, I finally told my I told my mom today about the scooter. Showed the, showed her the scooter, and uh, and I could have done this earlier. Apparently, I thought that she was gonna worry and freak out. But uh, no, she's like, oh, okay, well, as long as you're wearing a helmet. I'm like, that's it? This is what I was worried about? Oh, that's right. I am in my 40s. You know, who knows? She may still con contact me later and go, you know what? I just make sure that, you know, please be safe. But, uh, you know, I think it's, I think she's not as worried because at least I, at least Sober John is riding a scooter. <laughs> But yeah, I've got a scooter now. I vape. Good Lord. I don't, you know, I don't grease my hair back anymore. I don't know. It's, uh, things change. I guess that's what we're supposed to do, right? We change. Well, that's it for me, you guys. Thanks you for thanks for joining and I uh, joining me. And also, I realize that a lot of this is probably uh, repeating that how I got sober at the last minute episode or um, things that I've said often. But uh, I I don't know. I think it all it's worth repeating, especially on a day like today. I'm just kind of recognizing uh, a milestone, I suppose. Even though it's all about. Uh, a frame of mind not about a, a time amount of time because time is a uh, yeah you get it it's all about a mindset but uh, regardless of the mindset yay seven years thank you guys this has been Yes I'm Still Sober I'm John Rabin we'll see you next week later later <laughs>